when we have a multifactorial disease, we need to have a multifactorial strategy for prevention. Um, unlike with feline upper respiratory infection, not one of these is going to be our super magic bullet to really vanquish the whole disease. So we need to use all the tools in our box. We're going to start with our favorite because it's the easiest vaccination. Here's all the players. And so we have vaccines for about half of the ones we know of and none of the ones we don't know of. <laughs> um, awesome vaccine available for one of them. So only for distemper do we have a vaccine that prevents infection and clinical signs. For all the others, the best we can do is reduce the severity and frequency of infection and reduce the level of shedding. So vaccine... Not a huge tool to prevent respiratory disease in general, but a huge tool to prevent distemper. Only reason, I think, for using the flu vaccine around here would be if you're transporting dogs in from endemic areas. So if you're transporting ever from Colorado, for instance, or from Florida or from the Northeast, or if you're in one of those areas, then you might want to use it, or if you have any clients that are, uh, that are engaged in that activity. Um, but the thing about that vaccine is it does take two doses, two to four weeks apart, then two weeks to provide protection. So the dynamics of most situations are such that it's not going to work on time to protect the animal during their period of high risk. Kennel cough vaccination, and I have that picture to say this is prison inmates with three-inch long fingernails. They still are able to give an ion vaccine to every dog on intake, so it can be done. <laughs> and... Um, Really, the intranasal vaccine is the best choice, if it's possible, to give that at all. So more rapid protection, local protection, um, maybe even some nonspecific protection. This was a study that just came out. I'll talk about it tomorrow. When cats were vaccinated with the intranasal herpes calisi vaccine and then exposed to bordetella, they got milder d disease. And in fact, when we vaccinated cats with the intranasal herpes calisi vaccine and exposed them to a virulent calisi virus against which the vaccine did not generate protective antibodies, and we knew that, they still got milder disease. So generation of nonspecific immune factors locally and for protection against Bordetella, just straight competitive binding for binding sites in the upper respiratory tract can offer some immediate protection. Um, so we don't get that with the sub-Q vaccine. In addition, older research that showed that the sub-Q vaccine performed well in some ways was based on the whole antigen vaccine, which is no longer available. The only vaccine we have now is an antigen extract vaccine, which hasn't performed as well in the studies that we have as the intranasal vaccine has. There's now an oral vaccine out as well. That was tested in puppies, and they were challenged five weeks after vaccination. Puppies probably have a better, response, a better ability to respond immunologically to something that's delivered in the mouth versus in the nose, just because of the way their immune systems function at that age. So the vaccine had its best chance to work because it was given in young puppies, and then there was a long period between administration and challenge. And it did provide protection under those circumstances. But the intranasal vaccine is documented to provide protection within a few days of administration, even in adult dogs. So, you know, better support it. If you can get it in the nose, use that product. If you can't, get something in there, oral or the sub-Q vaccine. In general, you only need to give that vaccine once. So... We don't see maternal antibody interference with the intranasal vaccine, another advantage of vaccinating by that route. Um, and we'll see whatever response we're going to see after the first vaccine, except if you give it in a very young puppy. So if you give it in a pup under six weeks of age, repeat it when the pup is six weeks of age or older. Probably better protection from the multivalent products than from the monovalent product, although if there's a big cost difference, the level of protection might not be worth the difference. So, you know, if you get a great deal on the bivalent or monovalent, it's convenient for you, you like it, then go ahead and use it. But if it's all the same, get the trivalent product. And uh, 
For those of you, do any of you work mostly with boarding facilities where you have the opportunity to pre-vaccinate dogs? So, you know, it does, it provides some protection within a few days, but it really takes a week to provide full protection. So vaccinating simultaneous with intake, better than nothing, but not ideal. If you have the opportunity to require pre-vaccination, if you do scheduled intake to your shelter, and you can have animals come in and get the vaccine and then go home and have a week or so for that to take effect, that's really the ideal way to deliver that vaccine. Um, talked a little bit about distemper vaccination. It's the closest thing we have to a magic bullet against disease in the form of a vaccination. It's really one of the best vaccines in human or veterinary medicine. Um, modified live and recombinant products are available. Both are rapidly protective in the absence of maternal antibody interference. So they did studies with the old modified live vaccine where they took puppies, they vaccinated them, and they tossed them into an area where 400 dogs were in all stages of dying of distemper and found that the majority of puppies were protected against severe disease and death. So, wow, vaccination simultaneous with exposure. Most puppies were actually protected, and that's because distemper doesn't go systemic right away, and so the body has some time to respond to the vaccine, as well as possibly that vaccine itself competitively binding for attachment sites that the virus otherwise might want to attach to. Um, the recombinant vaccine was tested, and when puppies were exposed just four hours after vaccination with the recombinant vaccine, they also were protected against severe disease and death. And that's impressive. It's more than we expected from a recombinant vaccine because just one little antigen stuck into another carrier virus. So it's better than we think that a recombinant vaccine would tend to do. However, probably the modified live vaccine is a little bit more robust, a little bit broader in the, the protection that it generates, cell-mediated as well as antibody protection, and maybe a little bit faster. So for puppies or dogs that are going to be exposed rapidly coming in the door of a shelter, we now recommend the modified live over the recombinant vaccine. And that's a little bit of a new recommendation because when the recombinant vaccine came out, that research that it protected within four hours was newer than the research from 30 years ago that it protected right away. And so people thought, wow, the recombinant protects really fast. Well, it does, but the modified live might even protect a few minutes faster. Um, and so shelter switched over to the recombinant vaccine. And for instance, our shelter switched over to the recombinant vaccine, and that was part of what was going on before we saw our first ever distemper outbreak in 20 years. So high-risk environment, for the most part, modified live vaccine for a pet, any vaccine, they're both great as long as they're not going to be exposed 15 minutes later. Um, obtain from a reputable source. Handle with care if you're working with a distemper situation. Find out. So we've had a parent vaccine-resistant distemper where when we asked some more questions, they were getting it from the flea market. And the nice thing about distemper is it's easy to kill. The sad thing about the modified live vaccine is that it's easy to kill. So if it gets left out, it's going to lose its efficacy. And if that animal is going to be really challenged with this temper, it's going to have needed to have that vaccine before, on board. So much more susceptible than parvovirus to inactivation just by mishandling. So um, shelter environment, modified live, on intake for dogs four to six weeks of age and up. So the lower end if it's a high risk situation. Um, repeat every two weeks as long as they're in the shelter every three to four weeks once they're out of the shelter. But either way, whenever you have a uh, um, shelter source puppy, you want to give the last vaccine at 18 to 20 weeks of age. That's an update in the new 2011 AHA vaccine guidelines. So vaccinating out a little bit longer than we have been to make sure that that last vaccine that gets in the door is going to break through maternal antibody and provide protection for the next year. Questions about that? Single most important thing you can do to control canine distemper. And if you're working with a transfer organization, single best thing you can do is buy vaccines for the transfer organization and insist that they be given on intake if that animal is going to be transferred into your facility.
Pet puppies, similar, except that you can use either the modified live or the recombinant, starting at six to eight weeks, repeating every three to four weeks. But still, we want to get that final vaccine in at 18 to 20 weeks for shelter pups or pups from a questionable background. And the reason for that is twofold. One is that the vaccine schedule is based on the expectation that the that the bitch was vaccinated and had maternal antibodies to pass along to the pups. And if the maternal antibodies were from a vaccinated mother, then they're going to tend to wear off by usually before 14 weeks of age, but at least by 14 to 16 weeks of age. And so we're going to see protection. But if the mother survived field strain infection for distemper or parovirus, she's going to give a whopping high load to the puppy. And it may not wear off by the time the pup is 14 to 16 weeks of age. It's going to be in a small percentage, 2, 3, 4% at the most. But that's still, you know, up to a 4% chance of being unprotected for a fatal disease for up to a year of life, of their highest risk year of life for the most part. The other reason is that a lot of times we do not know how old <laughs> puppies are. And so we just err on the side of giving that last vaccine when we're sure that it's going to work. It's low risk. It's low cost. It's probably the most important vaccine they're ever going to receive in their entire lives. Um, and the reason I say questionable source is because, you know, if they got it from a pet store, it could have been a puppy mill background where maybe the mother did have distemper and you don't know, or maybe they got inaccurate information about the age. Just understand that should be treated like a shelter pup. And that doesn't mean they have to be vaccinated every two weeks up until that last vaccine, but do vaccinate them one last time. And oftentimes I can go with the rabies vaccine as well. Questions about that? Um, so we talked about the fact that it takes a little bit more time to provide complete protection. And also, maternal antibody interference is a reality. Um, so we get questions about, like, this must be vaccine resistant because we're seeing it in vaccinated pups. This is a study that they did of percentage of puppies with significant antibody response to eight different vaccines. And the very best one got a little over 80%. Most of them got under 80%, and some were as low as 20%. The recombinant vaccine did the best job in that study of breaking through maternal antibodies. So if you know that a puppy has maternal antibodies, the recombinant vaccine is the best choice. So for a while, we were recommending that for shelter puppies until this study came out of Florida that showed that 83% of puppies coming into a shelter did not have maternal antibodies, and so they needed the super rapid protection of the modified live vaccine. And that just makes sense. The same risk factor for being a puppy winding up in an animal shelter is a risk factor for you were born to a mom who wasn't spayed and wasn't vaccinated. So logically, we don't expect puppies in shelters to have maternal antibodies for the most part. That's why we're able to vaccinate at a much earlier age. So most puppies born to a vaccinated mother, if we give them a vaccine at four weeks of age, the maternal antibodies eat it all up and it doesn't do any good anyway. But if we have a puppy and more and more puppies, like the same risk factor for birth, is the risk factor for being unvaccinated. Very few people vaccinate their dog and allow it to breed unless they're a breeder. So think about that when you're thinking about your vaccine strategy for puppies in general, where they came from. Yeah. We get a pregnant animal in the shelter. Yeah. How quickly, and we vaccinate her. Mm-hmm. How quickly will her puppies? She, they won't. How, how long does she have to be pregnant? Just pass that on to them. That's a good question, actually. <laughs> You know, the antibodies are generated, like there's protection within hours. We see the antibodies within one to two weeks. So I would think if she's got the antibodies, she's got the antibodies. So if, she, if she's vaccinated a couple weeks or more before she gives birth, she'll have the antibodies to pass along to the puppies. Yeah? Do you want to be vaccinating Good question, and I was just about to address that. Um, for cats, we're just like, yeah, vaccinate them, vaccinate them, and uh, why aren't you spaying them anyway? <laughs> um, <laughs> for dogs, spay abortion is a little bit less common. If you're going to do a spay abort, then for sure, you know, you want to vaccinate them. 
Um, also, the risk of distemper, parvo, isn't, doesn't tend to be as high as the risk of panleukopenia and respiratory disease for cats. It's just not as ramp- rampant. So you really want to balance it more. There is some risk of vaccinating a pregnant dog um, of causing damage to the puppies. It's not commonly documented, but it's, you know, we know that it, it exists. If she's ever been vaccinated, then her own immune system is going to just bat that vaccine right out of there. and The puppies are never going to see it, but you don't know that history. So ideally, you know, you can use the recombinant vaccine. There is no killed vaccine, so we don't really have that option available to us. So if you can just mechanically isolate her from exposure to parvo distemper while she's pregnant and then vaccinate her after the puppies are born, that would be the better choice. And especially if she's impounded as part of a legal case, you want to be very careful about vaccinating pregnant dogs if you could get, if you could be liable if they end up aborting. So puppies less than five months of age and, you know, less and less so the younger they are, cannot be reliably protected by vaccination. So if they got, if they have, were born to a mother who had, had just recovered from field strain infection, they had a whopping dose of maternal antibodies and you vaccinated them at four, six, eight, ten, 10, and 12 weeks of age, they could perfectly well have plenty of maternal antibodies to bat back all of those vaccines and they were never protected, and they're still unprotected. And if you sit around waiting for vaccine protection to kick in, all you're doing is keeping that puppy in a high-risk environment and letting them get exposed to disease while their maternal antibodies dwindle. (laughs) On the other hand, if they had no maternal antibodies to start with, the very first vaccine they received provided protection against distemper within hours. It provides protection against parvovirus within days, and they're never going to get any safer than they already were. So we don't wait around to consider puppies safe. We vaccinate them, and then we put them into the lowest risk situation we have available as quickly as possible. And the same holds true for pet puppies. We don't know which vaccine breaks through, but there's no such thing as a need for actually a booster series of those those vaccines. They're either effective because they broke through maternal antibody, or they're not effective because they didn't. Puppies are no safer after two or three than they were after one. Does that make sense? So that's a very common sort of mistake is, is waiting for the two vaccine protection to kick in. So really what we want to do with puppies is minimize their time in animal shelters, prioritize. I, they fit into stainless steel cages, so we tend to put them in stainless steel cages. But if there are any double-sided runs in the shelter where the puppy can just go in and stay in there and not have to be handled all the time for cleaning and for care and for urination and defecation, reserve those double-sided runs for the puppies. And, you know, do something else. Combine the adult dogs if you have to, to house multiple ones in a run, to free up double runs for puppies. If you can't, you know, try cutting holes in between cages. And this can be done fairly cheaply. I have the instructions on our website so that puppies are in double-sided housing and aren't taken out of their runs while they're in a shelter. 